Welcome to our webinar called Reinventing the Industrial Legacy City. This lecture is by Klaus Philipson. He will talk about industrial legacy cities that are struggling to redefine themselves in a post-industrial world using Baltimore as a case study. Klaus Philipson is president of Arc Plan Incorporated an architecture and urban design firm in Baltimore specializing in community revitalization, adaptive reuse, historic preservation, and transportation projects since 1992. Philipson writes about urban issues on his blogs, the Community Architect blog and the Community Architect Daily blog. He is author of the book called Baltimore Reinventing the Industrial Legacy City. He has taught architecture, urban design and planning as an adjunct faculty at the University of Maryland and at Morgan State University. This lecture is hosted by Baltimore Rotterdam Sister City Committee, Morgan State University School of Architecture and Planning and the Rotterdam Academy of Architecture and Urban Design. Thank you and welcome Klaus Philipson. This, uh is the foreword in my book, The Industrial Legacy City, that is written by Alec Ross, who is a friend of mine, a resident of Baltimore, and who was gracious to, to write the foreword. If you can read that yourself, I don't need to read it out. It describes very nicely the uh, issue that we have, the topic that we have up today on uh, how an industrial legacy city goes through the various phases. And then just to be clear where we are, here is Baltimore, uh, Port City, and next to the capital of Washington, and then Rotterdam, just like Baltimore, next to the capital, The Hague, and also a Port City. And then here are a few comparisons. Baltimore's port is much smaller. It's number nine in the US. Rotterdam's is number one in the Netherlands and the top 10 in the world. The population of the two cities is about in the same order of magnitude with 600,000 plus people. Similar density, also Baltimore has a smaller land area. Baltimore was once an immigration entry port. Rotterdam has 51% foreign born population. Baltimore has a much bigger airport than Rotterdam and Rotterdam has a much bigger train station than Baltimore. Baltimore has a higher income average, but also a higher level of inequality in income. Baltimore has lots of attractive historic architecture and Rotterdam is full of avant-garde modern architecture. Both cities have a strong industrial past and both are affected by rising sea levels. The shift from agriculture to industry and from industry to services and from services to knowledge is never, strict, uh, never strictly sequential. Lots of these things happen parallel, nor does it come without tension, friction, and even violence. Hope and despair, destruction and glory seem to be always closely intertwined in my hometown of Baltimore. Baltimore is not all alone in this pronounced urban ills, located in the wealthiest state in the US, but with over 20% poverty rate, it is representative of many industrial Rust Belt cities. Glory and despair coincide and highlight the increasing inequities of the post-industrial society. I wanna give you a very quick rundown visual tour of, of Baltimore that starts out with people. The shift from making to knowledge is also a shift from things towards people with deep implications for how to shape the future city. The architect deals with people and with things and is very well positioned to eliminate this transition. So this will be 100 and 20 slides in less than five minutes. So hold on to your seats. And while you have any kind of ideas, questions, impressions about these pictures, um, then please write them into the Q&A. 
So starting with people demonstrating in front of City Hall, enjoying themselves, going to school, installing funky art, and once in a while breaking out into unrest as here in 2015 after the death of Freddie Gray in the hands of police. Enjoy public markets, eat in food halls from food trucks, make music, baguette street corners, protest for more transit, drink micro brew beer, enjoy the flower mart, demonstrate against Trump, ride bike, play in water, do Zumba in the street, shop from horse carts, and under COVID, eat out in parking spaces. Water is the reason for Baltimore's existence. It's immigration, it's attraction to visitors and presidents, and it is also a threat from climate change. Baltimore's industry, once entirely carbon-based, shifted to food, trade, sports clothing, robotics, and back to small-scale making. Historic architecture is a strong element of Baltimore, from the first ever Washington Monument to some of the nation's oldest row houses, a basilica that made it on a postage stamp in the US, many other churches, old corporate headquarters, institutions, even a historic jail, old everyday architecture and icons of modernism, which are now historic. Abandonment by, caused by deindustrialization, some of it industrial, some of it residential, some retail or transportation and lots of demolition. The fabric of Baltimore is a city of row houses and tall buildings downtown with a few apartment buildings and more row houses more row houses, more row houses in all shapes and forms, even modern ones. A city of steeples and monuments, bridges, and increasingly housing in downtown in shiny towers or in new affordable housing. Adaptive reuse. In old bones, we find luxury hotels, condominiums, apartments, affordable housing offices, and even a school. Anchor institutions teach art, law, business, architecture, have world-renowned, we have a world-renowned symphony hall, and we have a world-renowned hospital. Our transportation went from being a smoky railroad city 
to a car congested city with one high speed rail line, two commuter rails, one light rail, and one subway line. And of course, many buses. We are now embracing scooters, bicycles, and water taxis. So after this whirlwind, let's dive a deep, bit deeper into the past, the present, and the future of Baltimore. We will ask what got us here, listing the big, the five biggest planning blunders, then transition to five successful strategies and end with some speculations about the future, what in the DNA of the industrial legacy city may work to its advantage. First, the past. Unlike Rotterdam, Baltimore was bigger and more powerful in the past, but was it better? It had the first passenger railroad in the US, the first electric streetcar, the first gas streetlight, and the crown cork was invented here. But there were a few things that prevented Baltimore to achieve its full potential. Chiefly, two reasons come to mind that it sympathized in the Civil War with the Confederate South, which lost the Civil War, and that it embraced segregation and even invented the tool of restrictive, restrictive covenants to maintain it. This shows successful success is not only bricks and mortar. Sometimes architects need to be reminded that that is not all there is to it. Nevertheless, physical things matter. Baltimore emerged based on its geospatial advantage as a protected port, its nearby tobacco fields, the first US passenger railroad, and many freight lines. Baltimore became the second largest port of entry for immigrants from Europe. For a brief period around 1830, Baltimore was indeed the second largest city in the US after New York. In the Industrial Revolution, Baltimore's industry included steel, textiles, sugar, spices, ships, and automobiles, and airplanes. As a result, it became a magnet in the great migration of Blacks from the agricultural South. But when industry declined, the great migration continued, and a problem emerged, unemployment. I will now highlight what in the past did not work. And I start out with segregation and redlining. Redlining shown on the left of the map was a federal policy that started during the war and excluded certain parts of Baltimore from loans and thus from prosperity, mostly based on race. The resulting systemic disinvestment meant sinking real estate values, deteriorated schools, food deserts and outright abandonment. Redlining hit industrial cities especially hard because of their large black populations. Redlining and restrictive covenants excluded black people from many new developments and locked them into place while educated and upward mobile segments of the population would move to the suburbs. Today, the formerly redlined areas have high concentrations of poverty as the map on the right shows and poor health outcomes. And you can see that there are direct relations between the red line showing where investment was banned and the red areas where the um, poverty concentrations are high. The health outcomes today are such that the zip code has become more important for life expectancy than the gene code. Life expectancy in Baltimore can differ by 20 years within a single kilometer. The second um, failed planning policy was closely related to segregation and that's suburban flight. The decline of the American city in the post-war period cannot be explained without the policies which lured to and excluded from the suburbs. The dominance of the automobile, the abundance of cheap energy and the real estate tactics exploiting racial fears. The depleting of Baltimore is a direct result of policies favoring dispersal and sprawl. The suburban utopias of Frank Lloyd Wright and Ebenezer Howard and Corbusier's Ville Radieuse 
were responses to the urban ills of pollution and congestion, but they also fueled anti-urban sprawl, separation of people and uses, favored private lots over public spaces and building out over building up. US policies kept poor people of poor people inside cities and moved the affluent into the periphery. In Europe, it was often the reverse. The poor were exported to the banlieue. In the last 50 years, Maryland used more space for development than in the 250 years before. This is neither socially nor economically nor environmentally sustainable. Sprawl increases the carbon footprint and makes communities less resilient. Today, Baltimore is still a shrinking city in a growing region. While the city itself lost one third of its residents since 1950, the region roughly doubled in population. The next failure in planning is the autocentric city. The autocentric city is a direct result of sprawl, of course, but it is also an international phenomenon. I'm not telling anybody anything new with that, as elsewhere the ubiquitous streetcar system had been dismantled, lively city streets turned into one way auto sewers, and an attempt was made to build freeways through the heart of Baltimore. However, the freeway plans galvanized citizens in Baltimore into the Baltimore freeway battles. Most urban freeways were thus defeated, except for the Jones Falls Expressway covering the, covering the Jones Falls River and a two kilometer a fragment of the highway to nowhere that you see on the slide, also a product of the infamous Robert Moses, who was otherwise mostly active in New York. The African American communities in West Baltimore were gravely wounded by this freeway. That highway is now a symbol of failed urban policies and West Baltimore remains the scene of disinvestment, violence, unrest, and the locale for the TV series such as The Wire. 50 years after the wooners became common in the Netherlands, the emphasis on getting commuters back into the suburbs as quickly as possible is hard to get out of the minds of US traffic engineers. As a result, transportation is the largest contributor of carbon emissions in the US. Urban renewal is another one that I put in under the failures, also one can certainly argue with all of those points. Urban renewal was born from the desire of the city of being competitive with the suburbs. Its med medicine was lots of parking, slum clearance and demolition superblocks and big office towers. Today, most planners in the US see large scale urban renewal more as a disease than a cure. In some American cities, urban renewal did what bombers did in Europe. Luckily, Baltimore's urban renewal was modest compared to that of other US legacy cities such as Rochester or New Haven. But it left some scars to this day. Superblocks and new large office towers may have slowed corporate departures, but it did ultimately not prevent their demise. A now deceased mentor of mine, though, was in charge of early Baltimore renewal efforts, and, such as the Inner Harbor. And when he was retired, he cautioned me not to judge what was done then with today's metrics. That's a good lesson. Maybe he would really not like it that I put it under failure here. Baltimore's urban renewal gave us also some monuments of architectural monuments, mo modernism. One you saw, the Mies van der Rohe Tower, and one from Ian Pei, the World Trade Center. Urban renewal also gave Baltimore its famous inner harbor. Converted from commerce to fund the reinvented harbor spurred a renaissance for, the Baltimore, for Baltimore and gave the world a blueprint how to enjoy an urban waterfront instead of turning its back to it. And uh, we will come back to the, the city of fun in a little bit. Another Failure was public housing in high rises. Baltimore's public housing was urban renewal under the label slum removal. Many people were displaced. The Baltimore Housing Authority was formed in 1937. 
The first social housing project in 1940 replaced 315 demolished slum row houses with 300 simple walk-up flats placed in strict rows and facing away from the street. After World War II, the number of public housing units swelled eventually to 18,000, now with high-rise projects intended to bring light and air and modern living to the masses, similar to what Corbusier had envisioned in the radius. When the residents were working class families, the towers actually worked initially as intended, but in deindustrialization, the high rise apartments were no match. The working class in them was replaced by tenants of last resort, elderly, unemployed, teenage single mothers. Living in the high rises became a nightmare. Eventually, almost all public housing became less desirable, even the low rises. The fate of Baltimore's public housing high rises tracked that of similar projects in Chicago and St. Louis. Starting in the 1990s, all those projects were imploded as failures. Today, Baltimore housing continues the process of replacing now their low rise buildings into mixed use, mixed income, street facing development that was originally demolished. Once again, the poor results stemmed from a combination of how investments are distributed and how opportunities are as assigned. Social change in architecture um, planning. Uh, so, I mean, social change was really trumping architecture intention. Now we're moving on to the present, and now I'm moving from failure to what are tentative successes, enduring practices. I will list again five. The first one is preservation. And it is kind of ironic that the first successful strategy of reinventing the city is preservation. But preservation not only has stabilizing cultural and social effects, it turns out it is good economic development. And it is often more sustainable than new construction. Baltimore has more locally designated historic districts and buildings that are listed in the National Register District than any other US city except Boston. 72% of Baltimore, or with 72%, Baltimore has nationally the highest US number of buildings built before 1945. Many old buildings are still standing because of the freeway plans were defeated. It turns out buildings, old buildings attract immigrants, the creative class and millennials. Our best and most successful neighborhoods are the historic neighborhoods. But once again, great architectural bones don't guarantee success. Many of the same type beautiful houses stand abandoned in the former red light neighborhoods. A subset of preservation is adaptive reuse. That's a form of preservation where the old buildings are used for a totally new purpose, such as housing in an old factory, a group up in a historic church. A movie house in an old trolley barn. And I also lump into adaptive reuse, the uh, reuse of brown fields. In fact, the incredible array of creative and successful adaptive reuse projects is one of Baltimore's best architectural secrets. When I toured the city with a German architecture profess professor before COVID hit, she was floored how much high quality adaptive reuse we have. The industrial brownfield reclamation is part of this preservation troika. It too saves embedded energy and allows growth in already built up areas. Brownfield redevelopment is good urban renewal without displacement. 
Baltimore's thriving downtown extensions are all built on former industrial brownfields. So reinvention doesn't always mean new construction. Using the good bones of an old industrial legacy city is a successful and sustainable strategy. Then next success strategy or strategy with some debate is uh, meds and ads. Reinvention needs new, clean, and prospering industries. In Baltimore and many other legacy cities, higher education and healthcare are the new engines. Using them to pull up distressed neighborhoods is a strategy also called working from strengths. It is not undisputed because it's a triage strategy. Hitching investment to a strong anchor versus putting the money where the biggest needs are. Baltimore has oscillated between these two poles, between need-based investment and strategic reinvestment based on anchors. Limited resources ultimately force the city to embrace building from strengths in its current planning. Investment needs a backstop so it can create a ladder effect in which properties that are far below more market value slowly step up, needing less and less subsidy for redevelopment. Need-based investment is morally superior, but without anchors, the money disappears like in a barrel without a bottom. In an attempt to balance success and ethics, Baltimore City Planning has strategically designated investment target areas, but also engaged in scrubbing the capital budget of all city departments for equity. Then comes the issue of the creative class. Education and medical institutions as engines brought about the term of the creative class as the group most likely to help cities to move forward. And Baltimore never made it its explicit goal to attract the creative class, except maybe for private developers such as this vision of the year 2000 on the slide, which wanted to turn the old harbor into a digital harbor. This concept evaporated when the dot-com bubble bursts, which shows you know, the future comes sometimes different than one thinks. Still, the truth is that new residents coming to Baltimore in recent years have been largely young professionals and artists moving to waterfront communities, repurposed loft buildings, working or studying in Baltimore's eds and meds institutions while enjoying low real estate and great architecture. Unfortunately, the outflow of poorer residents has outnumbered the inflow. Even though newcomers rarely displaced existing residents, Baltimore isn't spared the debate about gentrification, which gives the creative class a bad name. Fact is, the reinvented legacy city needs young people with the right education for the new prospering industries. And then the city as entertainment, as I mentioned already, as this slide shows, um, Baltimore's famous developer, the late Jim Rouse, declared already in the 1970s on the title of Time magazine that cities are fun. Urban tourism has even more critics than attracting the creative class. The British town planner Peter Hall wrote in his textbook, Cities of Tomorrow, the rousification of Boston and Baltimore, a process to be repeated in a score of older American industrial cities, thus involves the deliberate creation of the city as a stage. Like theater, it resembles real life, but it is not urban life as it ever actually was. So yeah, the critical voice is right here. Um, Baltimore mayors began chasing tourist dollars only after it was discovered that the inner harbor, which was originally intended for the residents, could actually attract visitors. The focus on attractions and events around the inner harbor brought a series of grant projects, including an extension of the National Aquarium, a baseball stadium, a doubling of Baltimore's convention center, a new football stadium, two city subsidized convention center hotel projects, and most recently a casino that funnels revenue into city coffers. Next in line, big cash for an ailing horseback horse race park 
to save the famous Baltimore Preakness. There is a much doubt that these projects ever pay for themselves. Nevertheless, they are important elements in the competitiveness and psychology of a legacy city, definitely when it comes to baseball and football. And so I put them here in the success column anyway. Equity, awareness, and the vast needs of a disenfranchised population for jobs and services are reasons to question a strategy that is too focused on entertainment and tourists. The prevailing mood is to make the city better for those who already live here. This leads to our last success strategy, the livable city. Baltimore is known as a city of neighborhoods. This last reinvention strategy is probably the strongest because it combines all previous strategies and connects them to one goal, to offer a livable community for new and existing residents by rebuilding neighborhoods, fixing parks, improving transit, creating bike and scooter lanes, and making sure that there are fewer food and service deserts. In short, making the quality of life better across the board is a precondition for a healthy and sustainable city. Keeping residents from moving away and making them proud of their own town requires that schools work, police is fair, and the trash is being picked up. The basic stuff. Vast discrepancies between rich and poor are not sustainable. The COVID pandemic has made this point even clearer. A small example is when city when the city as the owner of streets changes streets into places of livability known as complete streets and particularly popular now under COVID for additional outdoor eating. Another example is Baltimore City's co collaboration with the state-run regional transit agency to create faster bus service through miles of dedicated bus lanes and traffic signal priority. So with that, um, the last segment of this presentation that deals with the future. Good planning means that the future has to be shaped and not just be waited for. Strengths of the past need to be leveraged and rapid change and unexpected need need to be anticipated. I will pick five topics, which are a mix of forecast and speculation, geopolitics, climate change, making and the future, making and the future of work, autonomous vehicles, and the gig economy. Starting out with geography and geopolitics. Based on its location, the Brookings Institution included the Baltimore Metro in a list of only 19 global knowledge capitals in 2016. Its location is still strategically viable as it was on this railroad map of the past, and it is part of its DNA. It isn't clear whether knowledge will continue to accumulate in cities and whether global cities will continue to grow, or as the Dutch architect Rem Kolha stipulates in his book and Guggenheim exhibit countryside, it will be the countryside that uh, will decide the future. Climate change is a large force in this question. Baltimore and Rotterdam's places are as global ports with the national capital right next door is and will be a great asset for the reinvention of the industrial legacy city, even more so because the importance of nation states will likely continue to, to shrink a renaissance of nationalism or renaissance of rural spaces notwithstanding. Cities will be leaders in the adoption, adaptation against climate change and climate change will also make it more important again where a city is located. Climate change and resilience. Cities are the leading consumers of energy and the primary source of greenhouse gases, but compared to suburban dispersal, they are more energy efficient, have smaller carbon footprint per person and location matters. 
cities that rely on massive irrigation because they sit in a desert like Las Vegas, Phoenix, Dubai, and others, or will be too hot without extreme air conditioning, will have a hard time to be low emitters or to be resilient. So will cities that are located right in the path of hurricanes on low-lying low -lying former swamps such as Miami. But tackling climate change will require more than a good location. It will need reinventing the system of production, transportation, and distribution. The industrial legacy city has reinvented these sectors before, and it is better prepared to do it again. Compared to newer cities that rely mostly on freeways for transportation, for example, or compared to new towns, which represent only a planning philosophy, one single planning philosophy, such as the huge mega cities in China, where everything is of the same age. The future city must be a livable and authentic home, a place where people not only work, live, and prepare food in an efficient and compact manner, but also where they like to be. Baltimore has the bones for energy efficiency and resilience. People used to make things will have an advantage when local production will have a renaissance. There will be plenty of jobs in the green economy that still requires making things. Those can't be easily filled with the retirees, ret retirees of Miami Beach, the movie makers of Hollywood, or the financial acrobats of New York. Baltimore consists of mostly solid buildings, has plenty of water, and will continue to have a tolerable and varied climate, even when extremes will be more extreme, as this particular slide on the left shows. To be prepared, Baltimore has drafted ambitious strategic climate resilience and sustainability plans. Now they must be enacted. I will next touch on two technologies that can help the industrial legacy city. First about making. In a world of energy saving and efficiency, the division of labor where entire countries or cities are just about knowledge and others are just about food or production will prove to be wrong. Even in an interconnected world, local production of food and durable goods will be necessary for social, economic, and environmental reasons. Some emerging te technologies will advance local production. For example, durable goods and 3D printing. 3D printing is dismissed by many as more hype than substance. Two, its usefulness is still emerging. When personal computers came out a mere 40 years or so ago, Many people also asked, for what are they good? Just consider this. If custom production instead of serial production becomes an alternative way of making things, the need for concentration of capital and the loss of the economy of scale will lose weight. If making doesn't cost much more than a 3D printer and some spools of materials, the importance of bankers and financiers will diminish. They have shaped our cities for the last 30 years or so. If everybody can be a producer, the shape of cities will change again. Goodbye assembly line, goodbye factory floor, and maybe even goodbye large corporations and merger mania. Big wouldn't be needed anymore. Decentralized local making could be a second chance for those who have been shut out from production during deindustrialization. When making things in our own four walls becomes a commonplace, as commonplace as consulting, working from home, or document printing from home, drastic social, political, and physical changes are certain. Based on the time it took to get from the Atari computer to the iPhone, there won't be very much time to plan for this future. If people are once again not only consumers, but also make, make her city will look diff different than in the world of a nine to five commuter. The future city will be mixed use. A city with mixed use in its DNA will have an advantage. Unfortunately, there is no guarantee that things go the way I describe it here. The current knowledge industry 
certainly shows no sign that concentration and mergers are obsolete. I talked about production of durable goods, same for food production. The Dutch have already demonstrated how growing massive quantities of food close to urban centers work. Hydroponic urban agriculture can bring food closer to the growing urban population. Greenhouses can on vacant lots in Baltimore Sandtown, as shown here on this slide, are just a simple beginning. Additional opportunities are vertical farming integrated into facades of net zero buildings, food production on roofs, or in repurposed distribution warehouses. And the trend to replace animal meat with plant-based or engineered meat, this all could significantly reduce the well-established environmental births of current industrial farming, current construction methods, and the wastefulness of shipping and food halfway around the world all at the same time. Another technology I want to mention is the, the self-driving automobile. It is sure that the auto autonomous vehicle will change cities dramatically. Will it be good or will it be bad? Again, different futures are possible. It can make traditional transportation failings even more dramatic through additional traffic and even more dispersal. If every pe everyone who owns an auto today will have a self-driving car and then send that out to buy pizza. But it could also, with the right policies in place and if AVs facilitate the insight that autos are a poor investment that sits idle more than 90% of the time, be a huge boost for dense cities like Baltimore with its relatively narrow streets. It could free up valuable space if rechargeable, emission-free vehicles used on a per need base will prevail. They will provide mobility where current transit can't reach. Parking garages, gas stations, car dealer lots, and Baltimore's bits of freeways could find a higher and better use. The electric fleet AV could give ailing transit a new lease on life. What's not to like? The second version could be able to dethrone transportation from being the biggest carbon emitter in the US and also truly foster a city for people. Mobility via transit and fleet-based automatic vehicles could be the ultimate victory of Jane Jacobs over Robert Moses. And lastly, the gig economy. The future urban citizen may be foreshadowed in the current gig worker. Already the gig economy has provided entrepreneurial access where to disadvantaged population groups. It is easy to engage and disengage, whether part-time, full-time, and regardless of skill level. In the gig economy, the combination of other gig jobs with continued education or with family obligations is possible. As I described, the gig economy offers jobs which don't, which don't require a big factory or an office tower. This informal economy is more treacherous than the historic steel job at Bethlehem Steel with its union negotiated good wages, fixed work hours, benefits, and pensions. Uncertainty may be the price for a much lower entry threshold for flexibility and a less regulated life, which are the rewards. In a gig economy, things have to be mixed, close by and flexible, just as in the many utopian communities imagined over the century, or just like in the industrial legacy city. Things may not turn out so rosy. For example, the gig economy jobs will likely be imperiled by robots and AI. In conclusion, I will give you a Ernst Bloch philosopher quote. Quote, humanity lives everywhere still in prehistory. Indeed, each and everything is waiting for the creation of a just world. The true genesis is not at the beginning, but at the end. 
And it will only start to come about when society and existence become radical, i.e. take themselves by their own roots. End of quote. Whether geopolitics making autonomous vehicles or gig work, the industrial legacy has a leg up. There is no good reason why it would, should not shine again in a new and different way. But other futures are also possible. Good planning, good policies, and risk taking are needed to unpack the possibilities. That you are attending this session shows that you care. And thank you, and I'm looking forward for your, to your comments.